and welcome to the Doof Book Club, our monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. My name is Matt Freeman, and I'm joined, as always, by the ferryman himself, Scott Daly. Hello, and welcome to the afterlife. So- sort of. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm so curious we're... to find out the nature of this afterlife. You won't. Oh. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. We hope you're all having a wonderful Friday. It is the 2nd of February. It's a new month in our new year, and uh, it's Friday night, and we're here to have some fun for for an hour or so. Um, If you are joining us for the very, very first time, welcome. We are Doof Media, or at least a part of Doof Media. We make podcasts all about the stories that we love. We also arrange and organize this year monthly book club, which Matt will now explain um, what is, in case you've never heard of a book club before that's right and in this case uh, each month scott and i select five books from a pool submitted to us by our wonderful doof community we put up a poll for all of the supporters on patreon at patreon.com slash doof media and let them vote on which they'd like us to talk about the book with the most votes wins and then we all read it and then we meet here on the first friday of the month and spend an hour or so chatting about the book in question. Before we get into what the book is this month, though, we do have a little bit of homework to do because one thing we like to do, uh, as Matt said, our patrons get to vote on the book for the next month. But we also let everyone that attends the book club live get their say as well. So I'm about to drop a, a link in the chat of this here uh, YouTube stream that we're doing, uh, which will send you over to a straw poll that will let you choose two of our five available books. We will take those votes at the very end of the show. We will add those to the votes from Patreon, and that will get us our final vote for the book. Um, it's it's a pretty close poll between basically all of these. A- every one of the five nominees this month are, are pretty close in numbers, so it's really anyone's game at this point. Um, so make sure you you drop in there, vote for your two, and then... Uh, We'll, we'll announce the winner at the end of the show. That's right. We do see a, a couple people saying hello here. How's it going, Bishop? Hey, Karen, how are you two doing today? Hey, hello to everyone else that is just silently lurking, which I no no problem. I, that's what I do. Uh, do you watch streams a lot, Matt? I watch streams a lot, and I don't ever say a word in any of them. <laughs> not not a ton, but yeah, I tend not to say anything. I tend not to say anything <laughs> because nobody ever uh, responds to me when I say things. And we try not to fall into that habit here. We try to be responsive. Yeah. So. Sometimes we get a little swept up in the conversation, but uh, yeah. Um, all right. Let's get into the main event, Matt. Let's talk about this month's book. What do we, what do we, what do we read and what are we talking about today? The book we read was The Ferryman by Justin Cronin, and the summary is as follows. Founded by a mysterious genius, the archipelago of Prospera lies hidden from the horrors of a deteriorating outside world. In this island paradise, Prospera's lucky citizens enjoy long, fulfilling lives until the monitors embedded in their forearms, meant to measure their physical health and psychological well-being, fall below 10%. Then they retire themselves, embarking on a ferry ride to the island known as the nursery, where their failing bodies are renewed their memories are ripe, wiped clean, and they are ready to restart life afresh. Proctor Bennett of the Department of Social Contracts has a satisfying career as a ferryman, gently shepherding people through the retirement process and, when necessary, enforcing it. But all is not well with Proctor. For one thing, he's been dreaming, which is supposed to be impossible in Prospera. For another, his monitor percentage has begun to drop alarmingly fast. And then comes the day he is summoned to retire his own father who gives him a disturbing and cryptic message before being wrestled onto the ferry. Uh, there was more of that, but I cut it off for, for your sake there, Matt. Sure. That's it was true. like three more paragraphs. <laughs> it was a lot that went into in this, in this quick, quick summary yeah. on Goodreads. This is a good, uh, this is a good hook. I think there's a lot in this description that gets, gets across like the intriguing part of the book really. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Matt, I want to know what you thought of this book. And while Ma- Matt is giving his answer, I want you folks there in chat to let us know as well. Uh, what did you think of The Ferryman? Yeah. Um, so I guess I won't sugarcoat it. I really struggled with the book, especially toward the end. Um, I, I I felt like it, it really meandered. And at like something like two thirds of the way through the book, I kind of felt like Hey, this would be a great time to end the book. Um, <laughs> and, and it just kind of kept going. And frankly, I stand by that assessment that it probably should have ended somewhere around there. Um, but there's a lot of cool stuff that the book 
uh, th- that happened in the book. There's a lot of cool stuff involving character that I enjoyed, mm-hmm. um, especially toward the beginning. There were a lot of interesting situations. I thought the mystery was was fairly interesting um, at first, and uh, or at least at least it, it interested me in the sense that I wanted to keep turning the page to find out what was going to happen. Um, uh, th- there's a bunch of positive stuff that we can say, and I'm sure we will say, but I think c- kind of on the whole, I just wish it had um, cooked in the oven a little bit longer. Um, what do you think? Yeah. Um, I'm going to need our, our audience's help with this one. Um, I did not like this book very much. So, so I, what I will say is, is you and I were kind of chatting as we read this book this week, like we normally do. Um, and I think I was much more positive on it than you were for the majority of the story, uh, until the end and, and the end actually did a thing that doesn't happen to me very often, which is the ending of this book made me actively angry mm-hmm. and I, I, I did not like it at all. And I'm so annoyed by some of the choices that it made and, and, and the, we, uh, my interpretations of what it's saying, uh, pissed me off. So we'll, we'll definitely get into that. Uh, but yeah, I think up to that, I, it was a real page. I read this book very fast. I read this book in like three days. I wasn't expecting to, you know, you do the thing like, I don't know if you do this. This is how I kind of parse it out. Like about two weeks before uh, the book is coming, I start the book and I like have it planned in my head that like, if I'm going to finish with enough time, I need to have read X number of pages by this day, et cetera, et cetera, down the line. Um, yeah. <laughs> and 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 like so I I did that and then like I was just tearing through it and I was like, oh, oh I think I'm going to finish much faster than that. And then boom, three days and I was done. So it, it's not as if I wasn't like enjoying the experience of reading. I felt the book was a page turner. I felt it was it was captivating enough to keep me going. And the the wanting to find out what was really going on here was a it was a good hook. But yeah, the ending, man, oh, we're going to have to get into this. But the ending just really pissed me off, it re- like really made me angry. Yeah. Yeah, I think it might be a little bit overstuffed. And, and I say that sort of out of a desire to to fix the things that I think are, are wrong, um, <laughs> because I, I liked it enough to want to fix it, which I think mm-hmm. you can view as a as a, as a sort of positive statement where you're like, sure. man, I like so much about this. If only dot, dot, dot. And, you know, in my case, I was like, I, I think that the sort of social commentary aspect was quite half baked. I, I really liked, you know, meeting Proctor and, and the other Prosperans. And, uh, and then it's like, why do we need to introduce this idea that there's the annex and all the other, like, like what, what does that add to the story? What is I was going to say, what does that add to the themes? And it's like, well, I know what it adds to the themes, but I don't like it or and I, don't, I don't think it improves the book. Um, I think it drags the book down, actually. Yeah. And it distracts from what was otherwise a really interesting story about like a man's sort of com- complicated relationship with the idea of the mortality of his own uh, of himself and his loved ones. Mm-hmm. Um, it would have been a much, I, I think I just would have loved this book actually, if it just stayed focused and it was like, a, this is a story about mortality and about how hard it is to accept loss and death. And it, it like, it all, it all comes together if you see it that way. And then it's uh-huh. like, well, then what's all this other crap hanging on to the sides of the story. <laughs> right. And um, yeah, that's basically I- my feeling about it is, it's a great story with a bunch of other stuff jammed in there. Yeah, well, except for the conclusion is you don't have to accept loss and mortality. You can just go back to sleep uh-huh, right. and get your daughter back. Hooray. Which, yeah, which is what made you mad, right? Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. So, okay. So I think I think let's start with the end. I think we could get into this and we could talk about we could we can work backwards and talk about all the other things we like. So the, the concept here, and if if you happen to be listening to this and you haven't read the book, we're about to spoil the big twist and and everything that the book has has to offer. So if if you care about that, stop listening. But um, essentially, this is this is a story about a man who builds a spaceship to take everyone off the dying planet and go to a new planet. Um, and in order to make the journey, they go to sleep and, and live in like a cryostasis dream world, which is what this whole, the location of this whole book is. We learn that our main character and his wife, whose name is Elise, who, which is also my wife's name, which is maybe part of the reason why this was particularly barbed to me, uh, right before they were going to leave to go on this, this trip to the new planet, lost their four-year-old child in a horrific drowning accident. Um, and the end of the book is essentially 
um, Proctor wakes up all the dreaming colonists, except for the rich ones that funded the expedition because they need to be punished. Um, he wakes all the dreaming colonists. They go down to the planet and start their life there. Uh, and then he puts all the, the rich ones back to sleep. And then he and his wife join them in the dream world as the ship heads back to Earth for some reason. Um, and uh, and he lives in this dream world with a dream version of his daughter that died. Um, and he gets to be happy with his daughter that he lost. Um, so here's why this makes me very mad, Matt. <laughs> okay. So f- first of all, if, if something like this were to happen to my child, like I, I, I could not bear it. I don't like, I, I'm not trying to say like, this is not my, how my, my reaction would have been. What I'm saying actually is if I lost my child in a horrific accident and you came to me and said, what if I can put you in a dream world in which you get to see her grow up and live? I would do that a million trillion billion percent of the time. There is never an instance in which I would not say yes, please to that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't, think that's a good thing right like mm-hmm. i i don't think that that's like that's that's a that's a good message to have of like of like yes you don't have to deal with this loss you don't have you can you can go into the dream world and have a dream version of this person you lost like it, I, the thing i compared it to when i was yelling at you about this earlier this week was it's like if the message of salem's lot was it was good to bury the corpse of your son in the evil cemetery and have him come back to life. That's, that's good actually. You, um, you mean pet cemetery, but pet yeah. cemetery. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah pet cemetery. Um, yeah. It's, it's just, it's so wild, especially the wrinkle that they add at the very end, which it, which he doesn't know about is that he has a son. He has a son or will have a son because he has an affair with, with the character Thea right before they leave and she is pregnant and he is going to have another child. And now that child is never going to get to meet his father because his father is living in a dream world with a, a, a dream version of his dead daughter. Yeah. And that I just get, I get mad. I'm, I'm yeah. mad about that. I don't understand what we're doing with, right. with this. Like, cause it'd be one thing if the, if the book painted this as not, and not optimal choice, but the the epilogue of the book seems to be this like happy, contented, like look how good everything is. The the, the bad rich people are learning humility. Um, he and his wife are getting to be happy and content with their daughter, who's eight years old now, an age that she's never going to get to. And I just felt gross. I just felt gross about it. Yeah, and, and it bothered me a lot that Thea didn't even tell him. That she's yeah. going to have a kid, which basically robs him of the ability to sort of at least like start over and create a new life and yeah. maybe in time come to truly great grieve his daughter in, in a way that is, you know, going to make him something close to whole again. I, it, yeah. It's very, it's very he, confusing. I, I, I didn't say because he deletes his memory too, right? He deletes his memory. He, he doesn't even allow himself to have the memory of losing his daughter. Like, yeah. So he's he's actively avoiding getting over it. And, and I'm not clear. Maybe I missed this. But did he wake his wife up and like ask her if this is what she wanted to do as well? I don't I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I, like which is also re- really bad. Uh-huh. It's like he just decided like, no, we're just going to continue living this delusion. I mean, if you think about just the story of his wife, it's like this horrible tragedy happens. She's clearly very mentally unwell due to it. Yeah, And then they're like, uh, you know what? It's too late for us to find a replacement for you to be like the server of, of our simulation. <laughs> so so you're going to be the server still. And yeah. then your your grief is going to sort of soak through everything. And, and then when we get to our destination, we're not even going to wake you up and give you the opportunity to sort of start fresh. We're just going to turn back around and you're, and we're going to like sort of reformat things. But basically it's all still going to be the dream world. So it's like, it's like you killed this woman. And, essentially and 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 like or or like it's it's like you inserted her into the matrix without her consent is yeah I, I kept thinking about the matrix and in in like an unfavorable comparison type of way where i'm like this is like if the, this is like if the moral of the matrix were like at the end they're like actually it sucks out here yeah so i'll go back into the matrix and wipe yeah i remember memory. when cypher says like yeah. i want to forget and i want to eat this delicious steak again yeah that's a good thing. Yeah, C- Cipher was the hero, and then yeah, and then he gets put back in, and then the the, the movie ends with Cipher yeah. eating steak. And, <laughs> um, 
yeah, th- th- it's it's very strange to me that that's that this is how the book ends because you feel like um, thematically it, it makes so much sense. It's it's called the ferryman. It's called mm-hmm. the ferryman. It's about the concept of this man who we don't know this when the book starts, but the reason why he's obsessed and 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 fixated on this idea of ushering people to the afterlife which is what his job is um is is that he had this horrible tragedy he can't actually remember what the tragedy is but he feels it in his soul mm-hmm. and he he is he's reaching for some kind of closure or some kind of absolution or or some kind of cessation to the kind of just grief that pervades his existence and so that's that's what he's dedicated his life to mm-hmm. and and the idea that this is the guy who's then going to say no nah, let's let's rewind the clock let's pretend she never actually died let's let's un, let's let's just pretend she's not dead yeah for and, and I, you're like what what it, especially since like the 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 climax of the book as Karen is is pointing out here is is him going back into the matrix and reaching out to his wife and and bringing the truth of of what happened back to her right like like waking her up from the delusion and and forcing her to reckon with the fact that her daughter is dead like th- this this moment of of absolute tragedy but like necessary uh, realization and and looking the truth head on, right? That is the climax of the story, and then we just go, nah. Um, yeah. that was good. That we we did that, and it woke everyone up. Good, good, good. Back to sleep. Back to yeah. sleep. Back with back with our daughter. It just it just like. And I guess the question I have here is: Am I reading this wrong? Like, am I just reading w- what what the book is saying here wrong? Because it just feels so. Ugh, I I don't know. Like maybe Justin Cronin lost a child. Like I, I maybe he did, and and this was a part of his catharsis with working through it. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, it's I so strange. It's so strange. So so in the chat, you know, most people seem on the same page as us, unless I'm okay. misunderstanding. And and uh, the clarification from Karen is that after the original dream ended, or uh uh. Elise accepted that her daughter was was gone, and then that's how she woke up, right? Or, yeah, I, I, I think ended so. the dream. Ended the, yeah. ended the first dream, and yeah. and then um, Proctor takes over as the designer, and he becomes the you know overlord of the Matrix for the for the subsequent dream. But it's mm-hmm. like so. So I guess she does decide to go back in. I, I, I guess we can. I guess yeah, but we can infer that that was a conscious choice. It, it, it the book didn't. We didn't see that scene, right? Yeah. So I I, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's. That's the, the that's the thing about it being kind of just just too much. Like, yeah, I I really really genuinely liked the first part of the book, like maybe the first third, where we're we're actually focusing a lot on character. We're mm-hmm. focusing a lot on Proctor. I thought Thea was also an interesting point of view character. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's there's like a lot of like you know the stuff i love about books which is like good detailed deep psychology su- subtle psychological motivations on, on different levels that are sort of you know leading to this character having a crisis that they don't even really understand like they don't understand themselves well enough to understand but the it, you still buy it yeah um all great stuff and then it was like there was there was this sort of high concept plot that that needed to happen and so the, this like carefully done character story character yeah. drama like character driven beginning part of the book just kind of becomes more and more railroaded into this like action movie where people are having gunfights between cars that felt you- so weird to me and and yeah. i think in retrospect it makes sense if you put it in the concept of this is all a dream and yeah. and it's operating on dream logic but yeah like suddenly like our 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 main character is like an action star that's like breaking into a building and like beating people up and i'm like what the fuck is going on yeah and yeah i i, I do think retrospect re- retroactively like that makes sense the other thing that makes sense retro actively is how nobody seems remotely curious about anything in yeah. this world like like the entire concept of the the nursery and the 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 regeneration is like don't worry um you're you're going to live forever actually because when you get old you go to the nursery and you get a brand new body but 
but your memory is erased. Yeah. So it's not you anymore. So what's the difference between right. dying and going to the nursery? Right. Essentially nothing. Um, yeah. Well, like I think as the reader, you know, not knowing the the answer, I was like, wait a second. What what it sounds like is happening is you're just going to the nursery and then they're just like, you know, cremating you. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and then there's just like a clone uh huh. A totally fresh clone that may, maybe isn't even a clone of you. Just like some, cl- some clone <laughs> is mm-hmm. is sent back, and they're like, "Here's Fred." <laughs> and <you're> like, <laughs> um. And and it, yeah. It, it, and yeah, like the the like one of the mysteries at the beginning of the book is like, why are people okay with this? Like, is this a yeah. metaphor for the fact that in real life people are weirdly okay about cert- about about certain things that they shouldn't be okay about, but they just yeah. kind of normalized it. And it's like, no, it's not really, I don't think that's, that's not I, really the point. I, um, I will say, I do agree with you about uh, all the first, the first half stuff, or I guess first third is what you said. Um, the, the part that, the part that really spoke to me was him having to, you know, guide his father to the afterlife. Right. Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. that I, I kind of, it broke me a little bit, um, you know, as a as a middle aged guy that uh, is is closer to having to have that happen with with my parents than than not. Right. Like that's going to be a thing that within the next 20, 30 years, God willing, you know, um, is, is going to be something I'm going to have to go through. And, uh, you know, I, I watched my father have to go through that with with his mother just a decade ago or so. And it's like that moment like really really fucked me up like i i I, it it caught me off guard like you're going through the motions of this thing and then i think the moment where his dad sits down and just says like i just don't want to forget her like that like oh my god (laughs) and just like having to watch your father experience this thing at like oh that was awful that was absolutely awful um but but awful in a way i'm like damn this is good shit like this is good writing you're you're like well well done um uh, it, it, it's it's really effective effective writing like yeah. I, I, that's kind of one of the things that i was like oh my god what is this book doing like i'm i'm totally on board yeah the whole sequence that that whole that whole sequence i mean like like the whole beginning of the book until i i don't even know what point exactly like pretty far into the book i, I was like this is great like i'm so mm-hmm. into this you know you, yeah. the, like you said all that stuff with him and his father extremely dramatic uh, uh, really kind of felt fresh. Like it didn't so much matter that I didn't understand the nature of the nursery because at that point in time, it's like, it doesn't matter. It's a metaphor for death. Okay. Yeah. Your, your father has chosen to move on and this is very hard, but it's necessary. And in fact, it's your job. Um, and, and even the fact that this is your profession doesn't actually make this any easier. And, and all these things like this is great, great stuff. And, uh, I mean, I feel like uh, the wheels began to come off the moment that we kind of introduced this idea of like, oh, there's some kind of sinister conspiracy happening. <laughs> and I was like, I don't really care about that mm-hmm. at all. Um, yeah, I, I agree. The the it's the character stuff is so much better than and than everything else around it. And I think like I I'm I'm going to preface this with I don't like being this person, but this book kind of made me this person where like a lot of the stuff in the reveal of what's going on is stupid. (laughs) (laughs) So like, so like just, just part, like we learn at the end of the book that this, this caste system that's been created on these islands was intentionally created by Proctor. The reason he did it was um, he wanted the future colonists um, to, to have like motivation you know, for, for, you know, hitting the ground running and getting out there and really like struggling to make, to make something out of their lives after they woke up. Right. That's his motivation. That's why he set up this system this this way. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Like Mm -hmm. a, the way things are on earth, we were told they probably already were going through something very similar to the, the, the system on on the, the in the dream world already right like these were these were the have nots of the world that that volunteered for this thing and like they probably already were experiencing that and and b like the hardships of life and and the necessity of survival will probably motivate you to you know not want to die right like it mm-hmm. just it just doesn't make a lot of sense at all 
Yeah. And like the other thing that like if, if you're trying to create a, a dream world in that prepares people for the realities of what they're going to have to do on this planet, why not make it a dream world that is a copy of what they're going to have to do on this planet? Why not teach them in the dream world <laughs> like how to survive in harsh climates, how to far like why why create this this sunny utopia? Like it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And and, and maybe if that's the lesson is just like oh Proctor's just a fucking idiot <laughs> actually yeah maybe i but I, it doesn't seem like the book wants you to think that i don't know i don't know yeah it, like it feels like there were two fun premises that he wanted to jam together and they just mm-hmm. don't fit where one of them is this idea of, of a sort of um fantastical situation where you have this metaphor for death and moving on that mm-hmm. that is a little bit of a twist on death where it's like well you don't really die you you sort of die, but you sort of don't die. And it causes you to ask questions about the nature of like, what is it that makes us afraid of death? And it's an interesting way of probing that question, just like all, all good sci-fi sort of takes a human universal and probes it by putting a twist on it. Yeah. And then this other completely different idea about like a sort of colonization generation ship. I know it's not a generation ship, but it's like, it's like sort of a generation ship because they're, yeah. they're, they're pr- pretending to be reborn. Yeah. And, and like, I love a good, you know, sci-fi kind of space opera as much as anybody, but that feels so tacked on and irrelevant other than just being like the, the sort of answer. I don't know. I I was thinking about like mystery box storytelling and and like Mm -hmm. lost. And I was like, would it have been satisfying? Like literally lost. Like if, if lost was like, oh uh, yeah, the, the reason all the weird stuff is happening on the Island is that. We're all it's in a shared spaceship. dream and we're all in a spaceship <laughs> and you, you, you would have like, and I think the answer is that people would have been like, okay, I guess that's, I guess yeah. that's an answer. Sure. But like, what the hell does that have to do with anything? Like it doesn't connect, you know, I, like, yeah. I literally, I watched this, this TV show a long time ago where this exact same thing happened. Literally exactly the same thing. Um, it was, it was like, a cop show about a guy who goes back in time or something and then all this weird stuff is happening and then the show was canceled and because the show was canceled and they didn't they weren't going to be able to finish it the way they wanted to they just had all of the characters wake up on a spaceship from their sleeping pods <laughs> where they had been having a shared dream together and that was the end of the series yeah and you were like what the hell is this <laughs> like this is nothing this is a clear, like, just pull the eject cord. We're like, we got to have a last episode. What are we going to do? I don't know. Mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. throw it in their face, basically, that, that, that we're not going to end this. Like, that's what yeah. it felt like. Because, it because again, it, it, I'm repeating myself, but it doesn't connect thematically. It's like two different themes. And he's, like, mashing them together. It doesn't work. Was it Wayward Pines? That's what an evil saying in chat. Was that the name of it? I'll check. I'm not, I don't even remember. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you in that, like, I, it feels like so, so I, I think it's very clear here that Cronin wanted to write a story that was making a commentary on the state of the world as as it exists right now. Right. Like there's this very clear, you know, super rich anti-capitalist theme going on here. Um, you know, the, the the concept of have and have nots and and and, you know, like he, he's crafted a story in which he gets to, like, punish the rich people. Um, mm-hmm. which is fine, whatever, or the, like, the, but, but I just feel like the way it did, it was, as you said, kind of tacked on and just didn't, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, the other, the other thing that didn't make a lot of sense to me was, or, or, or I, I guess it's not that it didn't make sense to me. It's just like, it felt like it was going to do something really cool and interesting. And then just, just like zagged away from it immediately. Like there's this thing that he sets up near the end of the book where I forget who it is that wakes up. I think it's Justin, the <clears throat> the person who's his assistant in in the story, um, like wakes up and or no, it's it's the kid. It's it's one of the ones that's the little kid um suffering in the in the slum area. Um and he he wakes up and he has all the memories of all the suffering that happened, you know, while he was in the dream. And it's like he he's he was of the cast of of poor people that had to serve the rich people and he's fucking pissed off about it. And there's this this moment in the book where they're they're like, oh, every person that's from the annex that wakes up is going to be like super pissed off 
And this is a thing we're going to have to, to, to confront. They're going to be pissed off at all the rich people, but also at me, Proctor and everyone on my crew that, that allowed this thing to happen. They're going to, they're going to be super pissed off about it. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's going to be this really interesting dynamic that we're going to have to solve. How are we going to handle this? And then the book just kind of goes like, and then a weird thing happened. Everyone just kind of forgot about it and moved on. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, why'd you, why'd you introduce that in the first place? <laughs> and I was like, like, I, I, yeah. I, like, I just didn't like, it was just a weird zag, like where it's like, it almost felt like he like he had like was on a deadline and was like, I don't have time to work this in yeah. <laughs> to this book. So there, I'm there's, just gonna... <laughs> there's so much stuff in there that, that felt like that. Well, I, I was, I just lost it. Cause you, you, you finished the book before I did. And I got to the point where all of our like key protagonist characters have woken up and they're out of the matrix and they're having a meeting and they, and they have understood everything that's of importance. And then their their choice to resolve the problem is to go back into the matrix <laughs> where their enemies are actually in power and put everything at risk like they could be captured that they don't know like they could be sent to be reiterated once they're inside like you're you're already awake just Go go to the go to the sleeping pod of the go main unplug guy. him. Go <laughs> unplug him. Yeah, just go. Like like it's it's so stupid. Yeah, it's so stupid. Like I I was like, surely we're not going this way. Or like, are we going to explain why this was necessary at some point? Yeah, it's necessary so we can have an action scene. I guess is the answer. Yeah, and 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 I guess to to clarify a bit here like this is stuff that if the character work in that half of the book was working on me yeah that i could probably very easily just whistle past right like th- this is stuff that if that if that if those moments were landing and if those beats were landing i would be like well this doesn't make a lot of sense but i see how it's doing work for character and like there is a little bit of that like i think the idea that they can't wake elise up and they have to go in and confront Elise in the dream and force her in the dream to come to this realization. I think that's a cool idea. Like, I think that's a cool moment. That part in and of itself. Like, I don't think you needed the 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 evil, the evil rich people conspiracy and we've got to eliminate. I agree. You could just unplug those guys. Boom, done. But the one thing we can't do is we can't wake Elise up. So we have to we like in, the, in outside the dream, we can't wake her up. The only way to get to her is via the dream. Like, I think that's a cool little bit. Um, and also like the way I, I love the way the dream world is reacting to her emotions, like, you know, the storms. And then when the, the, the van crashes like dramatically, like that's her, you know, struggling against the truth of the of all this stuff. I think those ideas are cool. Um, but yeah, there it's there's so much other stuff <laughs> mixed in it. <laughs> Um, I, I yeah. really struggled with it. And that, that that's, I think, I think the frustrating thing and, and perhaps the reason I got so angry where, you know, sometimes stupid stuff in, in books usually just makes me go, Oh, that was dumb. And then I just move on. And this stuff made me angry is because I love so much of everything else going on in this book. Like if it was just like boring and bad from page one to page 500 or whatever, I would just be like, eh, this is just not a good book, but like there's so much good stuff here. And then there's stuff like where you just go, What? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, I, that, that's the thing is, is there's sort of like two proctors there. There's like delicately, um, handled character drama proctor who, you know, goes swimming with this girl that he finds and, mm-hmm. and all these complicated layered emotions about growing older and his role in the world and yeah. losing and he wants his to job. Be a parent. And, he wants to be a parent. Right. And his wife has, vehemently denied it's, that and his, his it's, marriage it's, is sort of falling apart yeah and, and then there's action hero uh <laughs> proctor who is a totally different guy and like yeah. it, it, it sort of literally is a totally different guy because when yeah. he wakes up from the matrix you're just like and then he remembered his actual life and he basically basically passed that point which is again it, it's literally two-thirds through the book um no no he doesn't wake up two-thirds through the book but cl- close enough past that point he's basically not proctor he's basically he's basically a different character it's yeah. two th- two thirds to the book is the point where there are enough clues dropped for you to be like 
I got it. They're on a spaceship. Mm-hmm. They're all in cryo sleep on a spaceship. And then, and then it takes, I, I'm sorry, but and this would probably be fine if I, if I wasn't already kind of annoyed with the book, but it, like, it takes forever to, to actually get to the point of admitting that, even though you're like, yeah, yeah, I got it. Cry sleep. Yep. It's a dream. It's yeah, a dream. I, I got, I get it. Yeah. Um, I, I don't say this to like toot my horn or anything. I, I feel like, I feel like the common thing is that you figure this out well before the book actually yeah. fully spells it out for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, I'll say this well earlier it had occurred to me as a possibility that they were on a spaceship because of of the idea of the stars being different i was yeah. like okay that spaceship maybe or maybe space colony maybe maybe mm-hmm. other planet um many possibilities right like shared dream cryo sleep on a generation ship is not necessarily the, the the only possible answer but then once you get the element of like the stars are different there's this one particular blue star that they're basically headed toward yeah and then you and then you kind of get like especially as things become more dreamlike and, and weird like like when he gets to the nursery and we just sort of lose any pretense at the idea that stuff's supposed to make sense you're just like i think I- I don't think this is real, you know? Yeah. yeah I mean, th- yeah, the nursery is where we just like abandon. Like I was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> I'm yeah. so confused. I'm like that whole section was like, like, cause you go, you go into the, you go into the nursery, um, like expecting that to be the reveal of what's going on here. Right. Like, like that, everything seems to be building to that is like, Oh, our main character is going to the nursery. Um, th- this is it. This is the moment. And then no, you get no answers. You're just like, almost more confused because uh you're like people are there and then not there and then you're like there's what is what is happening here and then from there yeah it just escalates to oh oh yeah spaceship spaceship yeah um yeah um i I, there i mean like again though i want to i want to focus on some stuff i really did like because um I, i really liked i can't remember his name now it was a funny name the the blind artist character i forget yeah I forget. Oh, it started with a p it's like a poppy it poppy yeah i think, I think it was, it was poppy, poppy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah i really liked poppy um i really liked that idea of you know like like i love i love the idea of that the book kind of posits is that like you're in this dream world but like the truth and reality is like pushing its way through eventually like i think there's like a one line lip service to the idea that both um uh, Proctor and Elise had done this particular thing multiple times through the hundred and something years that they were o- orbiting the planet. Right. That this uh-huh. like in, in another matrix <laughs> comparison, it's like, this is the, you know, th- this is the thing we've had to do over and over again. And we eventually just delete your memory and get you back in your, in your dream and, and start over. I, I don't know if that was true or not. Like it, it could have just been him bullshitting to Proctor. Like there's nothing, else in the book that supports that that was what was happening but there's nothing that's specifically against it but i i do like this idea of like the truth and and reality and and perhaps your soul um pushing its way through uh you know Mm -hmm. this this dream and the idea that poppy because he's blind because he's lost one of his senses um it is is like almost more in tuned to that um and, and more able to to quote unquote see um, that then then other people are. I thought that was cool. And then I don't know. I liked I liked the moment with him in the in not in the epilogue, but on the on the planet when he was like, you know, sometimes I miss being blind. You know, like it, it's really interesting, interesting stuff there. Um, but yeah. uh, but in, in like a way that to to back to your complaint where some of the stuff feels really tacked on, like the the whole mother character, uh, which which is eventually revealed to be Proctor's mother, just like I kind of. And at the end of the book, I kind of forgot about her. And I think the book forgets about her too. And then you're just like, oh, wait, she didn't know any of this stuff was going on. Like, there's a moment where she's like looking around and like, wait, huh? What? And I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, she was not part of the, the, these conversations at all. I forgot about that. Yeah. No, that's funny because you 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 get the feeling like she's she's the one who knows everything. She has all the secrets. And it's like, no, she only knows the like inner ring of secrets having to do with like, oh, yeah, the the prosperians they're not good actually yeah we don't like them and it's like that's that's um yeah the stuff yeah. about poppy i thought that was it's uh, so, so i had a stupid theory um that, that was wrong but i i still like my theory so i'm going to say it anyway which was that um the reason he was painting people's faces is that like when he went blind in the dream 
that like his eyes opened in in the real world hmm. and he could like see the other the, the people in the in the capsules around him and so he was painting what he could see with his waking eyes um that's definitely not textual i just thought that was a fun idea so i'm saying i like it i it it, i i accept it and it is what it is the truth now (laughs) all right great makes sense to me so yeah i like it i like it i don't i i I don't know man i don't know i i i find it see that this is what this is the worst this is this is my least favorite conversation to have because it's Mm -hmm. when a book is just kind of blah and just kind of bad i i'm just like yeah okay well, well whatever the yeah. the problem is this book like really hooked me and i really kind of fell in love with it in the first 100 200 pages and then it let me down really bad so yeah that makes me yeah. upset in a way that i wouldn't normally be yeah i agree i agree um and and, and to be honest with you th- this is kind of my experience with justin cronin in general like um I, I don't know if you've read these books he wrote he wrote a trilogy of books um called the passage trilogy uh that i read a a while ago now um i don't know how long ago because i've lost all concept of time because i saw on twitter today that the lego movie is a decade old which is just the most absurd thing i've ever heard in my entire life but Uh is apparently true um but but stephen king recommended this this series um and and i i read it and i enjoyed the first book quite a bit um and then it just kind of from there you know, like if you take if you take this book we read and break it up amongst three books, I, I guess you could say I felt very similar to the ferryman, right? Where like really enjoyed the first part of it, and then my enjoyment of it kind of steadily went down as the series went on. Um, and and uh, that 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 I mean, I he, I think he's a good he's a good writer. Like I think like prose wise, a lot of this stuff is is well written. It's 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 easily easy to read. It's a page turner. But yeah, like it it feels like you know sometimes we get really nerdy with sci-fi right and there's these these incredibly intellectual science fiction writers that really want to get the details of all this zany sci-fi sci-fi stuff they're doing very very accurately and very very right and they want to think it out from beginning to end and i don't think he's that type of writer with the science fiction stuff like it just i don't think he really thought about this any of this stuff more than just was necessary to push the plot forward um, yeah and that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Like you don't have to do that, but it did leave me in a place where I was just like, "This is stupid." Uh-huh. <laughs> this, is, this is stuff. All your explanations for for why people made the decisions they made was stupid, yeah. except for the only person I completely related to was the first guy that woke up, looked at the ice <laughs> planet, and said, "Nah, fuck this. I'm going back to sleep." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. No, I, so that that's funny. No, you reminded me like I did think about the idea of um you know, what what do you do if you have this like ultra futuristic spaceship where you can just live in a dream world where it's not just it's not that it's it's not just a dream world. Like everyone else in the dream is a person, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um and, and then you get to your, you know, your destination and you realize it's not habitable. Like I, I was actually somewhat excited about the possibility of like, oh, what if the planet is just literally uninhabitable and they can't turn around and so they just have to live in the in the dream world forever. And like yeah. th- that would be that would be like an interesting ending. I genuinely was like, oh, that, I'm excited about this. Like because it, it's not that it's a t- total fabrication. Clearly there are elements that are a fabrication. And, mm-hmm. then, and then you can begin to ask questions like, well, how do you set it up? Like, how do you set up this dream world to, to sort of keep people sane? And, and, and uh, 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 is this a stable situation? And, and, and or, or, you know, I think for a second there, I was like, well, maybe that's, maybe that's what happened. Like, maybe that's literally what Prospera and, and, and the NX is, is that 500 years ago, they all woke up saw that the planet was uninhabitable and said, fuck this and went back to sleep. (laughs) And this is the consequence of their choice. Like that would, I was, I was prepared for that to be the twist. Yeah. And then it was like, no, it's it's not that it's just, um, yeah, it's it's just stupid. (laughs) I mean, the argument that Otto makes at the end of the book is basically like uh, Proctor, you idiot. Like it doesn't matter what you do. Society is going to eventually reform this exact model. Uh, no, no matter what right like oh you can keep all the rich people asleep 
uh, and let and let everyone else, all the annex people, go. Like, but eventually they're gonna they're gonna form the same system that that we had here, right? Um, and and I don't think the book says anything that makes me believe that that was not an entirely accurate read of yeah. of things, right? Um, well, not only that, but it's it's weird to say like, so so did did you force all the rich people to stay? Like, like like how did you? Like, sh- sh- surely not, because that would they be... They just never woke them up. That's horrifying. Yeah, they just never woke them up. Like, I, I get they're, <laughs> they're rich people, right? Yeah, like, they're rich people, so they're, they're bad. But, they're, like, they're also still human beings. That, like, yeah, they, they, they were they were rich people hundreds of years ago, and they've just been living in a simulation and basically mind-slaved for hundreds of years. Yeah. And now you just take away the rest of their existence by trapping them in this fantasy and not telling them. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but it's, I, but it's a sunny end. Like you don't understand uh, Matt at the end of the book, they're like in a school and they're like talking about like how difficult, like they're not the budget and like they got to fix the roof. Right, and it's right. just, it's just so peaceful it's and just, wonderful. And look, yeah. the rich people are learning. They're learning how to be good people. Um, but they're going to go back to Earth to do what? Why are they going? Yeah. Can you, you answer that question? Why is the ship going back to Earth? Why? You know where they would have learned to be good people is on the hard scrabble surface of Ice Planet. Oh, you mean um, the Ice Planet that like desperately needs as many able-bodied hands to work the land and grow uh-huh. food as possible? That is like desperate for manual labor? Yeah. Yeah, I I, I I I agree. I I I really sort of love. Okay, so 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 I, I I sort of both love and hate to do this thing where where I where I decide that the book is saying something completely different than what it obviously is saying, so that I can enjoy it more. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's funny to consider that Pro, uh, Proctor is actually just a monster <laughs> who who like recognized that. Um, dice planet was a death sentence and there was no way human life could survive on a planet with an average surface temperature of like 40 degrees or whatever because mm-hmm. you can't grow crops and there's no natural resources and uh everyone's going to die and so he just leaves all of the poor people who've been causing him problems there to, to die and then turns around n- knowing that the last hope of humanity is actually the prosperity and the, the rich people on the ship he just turns around and he's like yeah We'll we'll see if we'll we'll go yeah. back to Earth. Maybe everyone there is dead too, and we can yeah. just like fix that planet, and then we can you know rule there. Yeah, uh, I, I like this. That makes me enjoy the book more. So. <laughs> so 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 Karen is offering an interesting theory in in chat right now. She's saying that uh that the the Kalis the planet is actually just Earth um that went through a nuclear winter and uh they never really left at all and huh. uh, they've just been orbiting the planet the entire time love it and yeah i like yeah. that a lot i mean look th- essentially what cronin is doing here with with keeping all the rich people asleep and sending them back to earth is the argument is you are the people that made the planet the way it is right it was it was your extravagance and richness and and consumption blah 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 that made that that destroyed the planet and then you because you're rich got to buy your way on to humanity's salvation and 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 flee from the problem you created and by by putting you back to sleep and sending you back to that problem cronin is essentially say, saying like you don't get to run away from the consequences of your actions um which sure i guess i i still feel that that is incredibly <sighs> inhumane <laughs> like like even even if it's a, it, it, if it's like theoretically fundamentally an accurate yeah. statement like it, it's just it, it still feels harsh to it, me it, yeah i mean it's just it's such a like 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 reflexive flattening sort of like current year political thing to say so that people right, will cheer right. it's like this is it, it's it's nowhere near the like depth and sensitivity that he's shown toward character and and it's just like oh yeah you've you've committed the original sin of of being rich and so you I, it it's it's not clearly thought out it does yeah. like if that is what what he's trying to do which i i unfortunately think he is um because apparently like part of the motivation for the book was like 
the idea of of like the excesses of capitalism and, mm-hmm. and Elon yeah. Musk's sp- private space program, and I'm just yeah. like, okay, maybe you should have let that one cook a little bit longer because <laughs> this just doesn't strike me as a as a mature take on this whole situation. Um, yeah, I, I, it is interesting that in this this dynamic that was set up of the have and have nots, uh, Proctor had no qualms with putting himself and the entire member of his crew into the rich lavish get to relax and have everyone do everything for you lifestyle yeah. like like i i thought that was an interesting choice like you think you would maybe like separate the crew amongst the annex people and the the uh the rich people but nah uh-uh. we're all of course i'm gonna benefit from this you don't you yeah. want me to be one of the working class no hell yeah. no right i mean like like uh real life proctor is a horrible person actually <laughs> yeah, yeah um, i think i think so yeah like, proctor inside the dream you could argue at least that he's gone through a sort of purgatory over his like multiple lifetimes yeah where yeah. he's been driven to the point where he he chooses to be a ferryman as his profession because he he, he sort of senses the need to like move on right mm-hmm. metaphorically literally yeah. whatever yeah and um and, and he seems like a better guy although he's still sort of a sort of an asshole um he does cheat on his wife and he does like kick a guy's ass for trying to stop his father from running away which is almost kills that fucking dude (laughs) it it, in in the moment understandable i guess but it's it's like uh yeah whatever well didn't didn't they just try to pin the the fact that the other guy died on him he didn't really kill the guy did he no he didn't kill the guy he he actually finds him in an in an office later he opens the door and it's like hey it's that guy that yeah. you you were fired for killing yeah yeah, yeah. that's good i i mean i liked i liked all the i liked all that stuff where he like is heartbroken to have been fired even though he was going to quit anyway like yeah. i thought that was very very relatable and, and so mm-hmm. forth i agree there's a lot like that's the, that's the thing i think you said it you said it perfectly is there's so much good enjoyable stuff here that like the fact that that we've spent so much of this conversation just talking about all this stuff that doesn't make any fucking sense is is more frustrating um mm-hmm. because it, it, it's it's not even about potential it's just about like oh this is really this is a really fun book for so much of the book and then it just uh, like dissolves into head scratching mm-hmm. and yeah um and then there's a storm that destroys the house and no one thinks that's weird <laughs> i like th- <laughs> <laughs> Again, that's a th- that's a thing in retrospect. Yeah, it makes right, sense, right? right? It makes right. sense that like no one's like because at the moment, I think I think when it happens, like he almost like it's a tornado very clearly, uh-huh. and like in his like mixed dream state, he doesn't know what a tornado is. Uh-huh. Right? Like like he says, "Oh, this strange swirling cyclone," and I was like, "Oh, maybe they've never had tornadoes here before." Yeah. But then like ten pages later, he's like, "Oh, it was a tornado," and I was like, "Oh, yeah, okay." Yeah. Well, I don't like to do, do these kind of storms happen here often because no one's talking about how there was just a giant fucking storm. And yeah, in retrospect, it's it's a, it's it's dream logic. Like the, a lot of a lot of what's happening in this world is is operating on dream logic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and you're totally right. Obviously, it's just um, I think it's kind of inescapable. It's, it's inextricably tied to the way the book is designed where. Um, OK, so. So I think it's just not a good idea to have a sort of mystery box story where you're following around a character who's who is the you know he's not literally a detective but he's the guy who's trying to unravel the mystery mm-hmm. and and then to have that guy be sort of like severely mentally compromised is not really going to make for a satisfying mode of storytelling so so like you can take any other you can take lost and think about like the example of the characters in lost or you can take like um you know any of these sort of dystopian book uh, stories like i was thinking about equilibrium the the, the movie um, mm-hmm. because it's my favorite movie obviously um <laughs> and it's about like you know guy lives in dystopian society begins to sense that things are actually wrong and it's like okay what if you take any of these scenarios and then you add the element that like when something really weird happens they just immediately forget about it or don't notice it or whatever you as the viewer are just like, what are we doing? Like, like I, I it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating from the reader point of view. Um, and yeah, I get that. That's the way the I get that. That's the plot. Like that's the way the book is designed, but it's just, it, I'm just saying 
it's a very frustrating way of, of doing things. Well, and it's not even that, that like the, the book is like drawing attention to it in, in a way that makes you go, huh? Right. It's just like have one character ask another character about the storm and like they're, they're evasive and weird. It's just nobody ever talks about it mm-hmm. ever. Yeah. There was a giant storm that destroyed a house and like nobody's like, Hey, how about these storms lately? <laughs> like nobody says that. It's just so weird. Yeah. yeah. Right. The, the storm surgically destroyed the one house that was, that was c- contained some kind of mystery that we're curious about. And then, uh, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that, I mean, I mean also the idea that, that nobody ever questioned the idea of, wait a minute. So we go to the Island and then some different person comes back. What, what, what is this? What are we, what are we mm-hmm. doing? Yeah. Um, and, uh, well, I'm trying to think there was at least one other sort of like setting mystery. I think, I think the other setting mystery was just like, when when is this and where is this and why and why does no one wonder about that fact Mm -hmm. because it's like okay it's clearly it's clearly like like our future because they talk about you know our artistic history yeah they they reference plato's cave in this in this story in this plato's cave story they they reference plato's cave yeah specific musicians are referenced Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so you're like okay it's the future but like the tech but like it's low tech like what like what's happening and you're like you you keep waiting for the moment when they're like oh yes well we all we all colonized prospera after the great that never comes up and, and no one and no one wonders about it and it's not addressed it's not I mean, it's addressed, but it's addressed after hundreds of pages, and you're like, yep. okay, yep. Right, yeah, okay. yeah. D- David asks an interesting question. Um, I wonder how the story looked before versus after editing. Like, was this a story that that was heavily changed in the edit to to improve, to to tighten, or to pad, or um, change the ending, alter the ending? I, I mean, a, an interesting question. One, of course, you know, we're completely unable to answer in in, in any way. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, editing. Like in like in film and TV, editing does a lot to a story. It changes it, um, and I mean we'll never know. But it it does. I guess I guess would you say, Matt, that it feels like a book that was changed in the edit to you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, like I said, it feels like it was written with two different premises in mind, and it and it also mm-hmm. kind of feels like some parts of it were more inspired and felt cohesive and felt like a like a story. Yeah, and then yeah. they and then it suddenly sort of truncates and becomes a different story, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I, I don't know if that's a phenomenon of editing or just a phenomenon of like him him knowing exactly you know following some some stroke of inspiration until he hits a wall and then he's like well, I don't know where this goes from here, but I got this generation ship idea maybe I can shoehorn that in somehow. Yeah. Um, so I don't I, again I don't I don't so much know if it's editing as just like a sort of um, either getting stuck or or not knowing where to go and, and then making the yeah. best of it. I mean, there's a thing that can happen in storytelling sometime, and I think you probably know this. Uh, you you write a, a lot more than I do. Um, like where like you're sitting there, kind of brainstorming, and you're like, I have this idea, and it's not enough for a story, and I have this idea, and it's not enough for a story. But like, oh, what if I combine them? And the second you do that, you like in your head see like a, a lot of potential. And so you're like, yes, this is it. This is what I was looking for. This is the key. And you start writing it and you're you're pushing it along with these two things. And and like eventually you get to a point where you're like, oh, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. Uh, I, what what sounded good in my head and what worked in my head as I was as I was mixing these two stories together when I actually put it down on the page. Uh, isn't isn't working and and maybe i can fix it in the edit maybe i can like manipulate and push these stories together in a way uh, like but but ultimately ultimately doesn't doesn't ever come together the way i i thought it would when i first brainstormed the idea yeah i mean i would i I think something in that general space happens pretty often i mean in fact i would say as i've gotten older one thing i've learned is like if there's no sort of spark of aliveness to the idea anymore, then you should just give up on it. Um, and, <laughs> and one, one good way to kill that spark is to, is to sort of like artificially like jam cool seeming 
pieces into it yeah to be like like a child you know with their lego set who who starts adding like random other pieces of other lego sets onto it because they're different colors and that looks cool to them it's like okay i, I can see the impulse that would make you want to do that but you're destroying the, the synergy and and like holistic impact of the thing that you're trying to do and if you can't make it work as 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 the specific thing that it is and you you think you're going to make it work by plugging in this other thing all, all you're actually doing is you're like sort of killing both of the things mm-hmm. um and, and yeah and, 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 and extinguishing whatever spark of of inspiration what made you like these things yeah um, and and i i say this not from the experience of, of writing fiction a lot but i do know i've had like ideas for essays and like you know explorations of concepts and like in your head when you come up with the idea it sounds really good and you're like oh yeah there's enough here and then you actually sit down to write it and you quickly realize oh there's not enough here <laughs> actually it's like it's very easy to, f- to to fill the page in your head when you don't have to actually write each individual word and then suddenly you have to do that and you're like oh no <laughs> the, this this doesn't work yeah, yeah. um yeah yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I feel like I could feel on a sentence to sentence basis, like this was written from a place of inspiration and I love this. And Justin Cronin is a fantastic writer. And then like a few pages later, what the hell is this? This is sub YA level, like, like <laughs> just, just putting one brick on top of the next brick because we have to get to that thing over there that needs to happen. And, um, I, I didn't like that at all. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think <laughs> I think um, I think that's all we have to say about it. I, I like I, I like I don't know. <laughs> I'm still angry about the ending, uh, but I, I I will say that like this conversation helped me appreciate the parts of the book I liked more, which mm-hmm. I think is always good. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. I I I literally, yeah, I don't want to come away thinking like just thoroughly garbage like i i can see i can see liking something else written by justin cron and this, this doesn't make me want to say oh god I, you know i'm writing this guy off surely this guy's never written anything good i, I can mm-hmm. imagine like something from the sensibility that created the first third of this book um creating a really cool story it's just yeah. that that's not what this story was i think you might like the passage like i said i i i didn't enjoy the, the next two books in that series half as much as i enjoyed the first but um i think the the first is an interesting concept uh that is executed pretty well i it's been a while so i don't remember all the details of it but i remember really liking it so you might like the passage cool all right all right um so i uh, we are about to close the poll for next month's book i'm going to send the link again if you showed up late so please uh take a, a few minutes right now to vote for next month's poll, we will close that, uh, tally the results, and then we will know what book we're reading next week. Um, <clears throat> By the way, the the TV show I was thinking of was the American version of the show Life on Mars. Interesting. Yeah. Didn't know they made an American version of that, that show. And the ending of the American version is nothing like the ending of the British version. <laughs> All right. Just going to refresh this a few more times. We are going to officially lock it right now. Oh, oh, some changes. Some changes at the very end here. Oh, goodness. But I don't believe they're enough. Uh, let me refresh it one more time. All right. The poll is officially locked and we do have a winner barely eking it out. God, that got way closer than I thought <laughs> at the end there. It was looking like it was looking like Tana French was going to run away with it. And then uh, it, it got really close. But the the book that we are going to be reading for next month is The Searcher by Tana French. Uh, we are big Tana French fans on this this book club. One of one of her uh, Dublin detective series books is. One of the first books we ever covered on on the show, uh, The Secret Place, a book we both loved very much. And I have read every single Tana French book, including The Searcher. I did read The Searcher 
but um, she's she, a sequel to The Searcher is coming out this year. So I saw that someone had nominated this and I was like, oh, this is perfect because I can refresh myself on this book before I read the sequel. So um, it, it is a mystery novel. She writes mystery novels. The uh, she, the Dublin Murder Squad series is a series of books about detectives on, on Dublin's Murder Squad and, and the Dublin police. Um, they're very, very good books. And like the way she does it is there's a detective in one book and then they're partners with the detective. And then the next book is from that other detective's point of view on a, on a different case. And it kind of leads through all of those, all of those books, um, uh, like over time. But then she made this, this book, the searcher, which is not a Dublin murder squad book. It is about an American who moves to Ireland, American cop who moves to a small, small, small town in Ireland after he retires and uh, he gets caught up in some some um, crime related shenanigans. So it, it's her doing something a little bit different, uh, but in I think an interesting way. She is if you've never read Tana French, I like can't recommend her enough. Her prose is is beautiful and haunting and incredible. Um, she does a really she builds really good characters and explores uh, a lot of in in the Dublin Murder Squad. She was exploring a lot of. Um, a lot of um like uh i like the, so, some problems in irish society and and i mean obviously didn't speak to me personally on that because I'm, I'm not i don't live in ireland but um i thought we're just just beautiful beautiful books uh david asked isn't that the plot of hot fuzz <laughs> no he wasn't an american That's in hot true. fuzz he was just coming from london but he did move to a very very small town and and it is all for the greater good it is all for the good yeah <laughs> oh my god uh the search is a very good book i, I think you all are going to really really enjoy it um and i can't wait to read it again so uh we'll be meeting here on the i believe the first of march march 1st uh to discuss this book four weeks from tonight uh so get the book start reading and uh and i hope you folks really enjoy it uh it's it, and i think you will do what i did the first time we covered tana french on this book club was i immediately got every other book she's ever written and read them all. <laughs> and I spent the next like six months reading everything Tana French has ever written because yeah. she's 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 wonderful. Well, I'm super excited. I love Tana French. I have not read everything she's written because I want to like spread them out over the remainder of my years so that I that's can... probably a smart thing to do. Um because I have like basically since I did that, like just patiently waited every few months, <laughs> like going to tanafrench.com and being like, Oh, huh, haven't written a new book yet, Tana. <laughs> Get how off long, your ass. How long has it been? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. So can't wait to talk about that with y'all. Um, thank you so much for hanging out with us. I, I'm sorry. Like, I know there's people that like this book more than us, and I, I think it was a good conversation regardless. I, I do I do kind of inherently hate when the conversations have the tone and, and tenor of this. Uh, I, I think we tried to be as charitable and, and fair as possible. But uh, yeah, there was just a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of stuff in this in this book that that annoyed me, but uh, overall, you know, some pretty good stuff too. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Um, and if you're listening to this uh, after the fact, if you're listening to the audio recording, hope you'll come talk about Tana French with us next month. Uh, I, I, if you've never read her again, I'm going to stress this: it, you're in for a good time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thanks for joining us. If you like what we do here at Doof Media and you want to see more of it, then uh, please head on over to our Patreon at Patreon.com/slash Doof Media. And consider donating to support our organization. Um, again, uh, uh, any available donation level on the Patreon will give you access to uh, voting for books uh, for us to talk about, um, and um, a bunch of other exclusive features and, and cool bonus podcasts and um, stuff like that. We, we try to make it worth your while, so go check that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, if you have any questions, comments, or just want to reach out to us, you can always find us over on X dot com. Um, uh, at doof media or email us doof media at gmail.com or find us on reddit that's r slash doof media um that's gonna do it for us this month thank you all so much thank you for all the kind words everyone's being very nice in chat uh we we really appreciate that uh glad you folks enjoyed the conversation and we'll see you in four weeks see you next month Bye.